and welcome to a small, medium at large podcast. I'm your host, Gail Heisen, bringing you intimate interviews beyond normal boundaries. I want to thank all of you listeners for liking, sharing, commenting, and just being there with us to explore all these amazing guests. We have done over 60 shows now with guests from all over, from all walks of life, all sharing their stories. I am honored to have our returning guest to a small, medium at large podcast, Stanley Krippner, for another interview. Before we bring Stanley to the show, I would like to invite Sean Rubin from University Professors Press Publishing to share a few words about Stanley and his amazing book, A Chaotic Life, The Memoirs of Stanley Krippner, Pioneering Humanistic Psychologist. Let's welcome Sean here today. Hi, Sean. Hi, How Gail. And thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here. I, I have three questions I'd like to ask you before we bring Stanley on the show. And first one is, what, what is your connection to Stanley Krippner? Yeah, well, I've had the privilege, privilege of knowing Stanley for over 25 years. Really, first as a graduate student through his work with dreams and dream telepathy and dream interpretation and analysis, nice. uh, and then had the honor of working alongside him at various uh, institutions of higher education, uh, and then as a consultant and supervisor and friend uh, as well. Um, anytime, uh, when, as my clinical practice was shifting to providing affirming care for transgender children and teenagers and adults, I, I contacted Stanley. He had already written papers about it 40 or 50 years ago. Uh, same when I was consulting on a case with a child who was uh, recalling past lives and other entities. Uh, Stanley already had expertise for decades in this area. And uh, and so always being just so uh, impressed uh, that he is, he's the consummate researcher and investigator, uh, seeker of possibilities. And to anyone who knows him, he's such an inspiration. So for me personally, he enchanted psychology at a time where it felt quite deadening uh, it felt quite rigid uh, and narrow. And if you look at Stanley's career, all the possibilities for investigating the most fantastic and extraordinary and mysterious aspects of human existence and consciousness, he's been doing this work since the early 60s. And so uh, our colleagues uh, at the University Professors Press, when we heard that he was uh, gathering his uh, time to do his memoirs, we really wanted to serve as the steward for his uh, incredible journey and his stories. Uh, so has it been uh, a connection that because of the connection you had with him, you were able to approach him and see if he would have your book with you and he was happy to do this? Is that how it all happened? Mm -hmm. You're both in the same field? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We first heard he was gathering them together and he was thinking of going with another publisher who maybe perhaps wanted to limit the scope of them. And so the guarantee that I made to him personally as one of the uh, main editors of, of, of UPP was that we would not censor anything, <laughs> uh, that he could take as long as he wanted and include as much as he wanted, and it would not have to be narrow. And we were true to our word. And as a result, um, it is a three volume memoirs. Uh, and in fact, the electronic version has even bonus chapters. So when we, when I told Stanley, write whatever you want, as much as you want, I didn't realize he has a photographic memory still for his entire life. And in so as a 90s, result, in his nineties. Yes. Yeah. And so it's nearly, it's nearly 900 pages, but I have to tell you, it is such an incredible read. It is the history of America, as much as it's the history of American psychology and of all of his personal experiences of his life and his contributions. It's an extraordinary life. He would get mad at me for saying that. He would say it's a unique life because he's uh, he's quite matter of fact and uh, just humble. the facts. Yeah, and very humble. Um, what would the su surprise? What would surprise the readers about Stanley's work and life? Can you just give? I know we have an interview uh, right after this where we get to hear from him direct. But how much can we get in that hour's time? Can you give us sort of like a, a list or captions or something of some of the things that the readers are going to find in this memoir, which you have read? Absolutely. Yes, that, you know, Stanley was one of the founders of uh, one of the most important movements in American psychology, uh, that of the humanistic movement, which was really valuing, you know, uh, the depths and complexity of what it meant to be human uh, relationships, the ultimate trust for the human uh, 
you know, that their subjective experience was trustworthy and important and in their lives, in their cultural rituals and experiences and identities, all of that need to be respected at first. And so as a result, Stanley was able to investigate all sorts of uh, everyday experiences, uh, whether it was an education, whether it was uh, in, in, with his graduate students, but also the anomalous and the extraordinary um, dreams and, and, and sexuality, which he helped to create uh, scientific organizations uh, to study. Um, and so he started, you know, kind of this trend in psychology and research, which has impacted, I think, all the sciences as well. You know, patient-centered patient, patient -centered values is now part of the healthcare system. And that started with him and his colleagues like Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers when they were looking at the field and saying, you know, psychology is missing out on so much. And so as a result, they created the institutions that helped to uh, students to come together to then further study all sorts of incredible experiences. Um, I'll say also that I really feel that Stanley was on the right side of history in so many ways. He was always advocating for democracy, for social justice and civil rights issues. He wrote to every senator pleading with him not to criminalize marijuana uh, at first, saying uh, about the therapeutic benefits and how it was not harmful by and large. Um, LGBTQ rights, uh, he was there at the beginning of, of the study of psychedelics and creativity and the arts and advocating for them. And so, you know, because we're so um, fortunate uh, for his longevity, he's been he's now seen 50 years later uh, from the original psychedelic revolution to now a renaissance. And it is coming, you know, it's supposed to MDMA for complex post-traumatic stresses has been put before the FDA and could be available by the end of the summer. So these are some of the histories. I mean, other little fascinating things. He was brought, he was uh, contacted by William Friedkin as a consultant on the movie, The Exorcist. Wow. Uh, one, of his, one of his graduate students was a gentleman named Christopher Ryan, who wrote a very famous best-selling book called Sex at Dawn. And I believe that that was his dissertation that Stanley was his supervisor for. Uh, and also when Stanley was a student at the University of Wisconsin, uh, among his the student union um, guests they brought in was Frank Lloyd Wright, and he had several dinners with Frank Lloyd Wright and his wife. So uh, again, as you read this story, it's it's the history of America, it's the history of American psychology, and it's the personal experiences of one of the more extraordinary lives uh, I've encountered uh, in the field and beyond. Wonderful. Uh, I think this should make our listeners very excited and interested to hear the upcoming uh, interview now. And is there anything else you'd like to share before I cut into that interview? No, but thank you so much for this opportunity. And thank you for advocating for Stanley and for all of the incredible experiences that your guests bring. Uh, I believe this is an important part of the future of uh, consciousness studies and the appreciation of what it means to be human. And your podcast plays a vital role in that. So thank you. Oh, I'm honored to hear you say that, but thank you. <laughs> So listeners, I'm going to turn us now to our interview with Stanley. So here we go. Let me tell you a little bit about Stanley. Dr. Stanley Krippner stands as a true trailblazer in the realm of consciousness exploration, pushing boundaries by delving into cross-cultural perspectives and the intriguing realm of non-ordinary experiences that boldly challenge conventional paradigms. With an extensive body of work, Stanley is an award-winning prolific author. His newest book, which we will talk about today, is a memoir titled A Chaotic Life. He has written Understanding Suicide's Allure, Personal Mythology, and Varieties of Anomalous Experiences, to name just a few of his many, many books. Stanley is also an esteemed researcher diving into verse subjects such as dreaming, psychedelics, creativity, shamanism, parapsychology, and trauma. Professor Krippner's insatiable curiosity has carved out a distinguished path, earning accolades and recognition across multiple disciplines. His intellectual prowess is evident through his membership as a fellow in five divisions of the American Psychological Association and his leadership acumen evidenced in service as president of Division 30, Psychological Hypnosis, and Division 32, Humanistic Psychology. Professor Krippner is a faculty member of several schools and institutions. He is an affiliated distinguished faculty member at the California Institute of Integral Studies and a fellow of the Institute of Noetic Science. 
The story of this book began when a fellow named Sean Rubin contacted Stanley's assistant, Gene Fox, expressing his love for Stanley and sincere wholehearted desire to represent Stan's work through his memoirs. Here is a book review by Dean Radin, the chief scientist at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. A Chaotic Life by Stanley Krippner is the astonishing, and I don't use that word lightly, memoir by Dr. Stanley Krippner. The book tells of a recurring theme in Stan's life where apparently incidental or minor events resulted in major personal transformations that ultimately affected hundreds of others in positive ways. The word chaos in the title refers to subtle or hidden forms of order described by complex systems theory and not to disorder or confusion. By magically surfing upon this orderly chaos, Stan transformed from a shy intellectual kid into a true force of nature, helping to shape the lives and careers of hundreds of scientists, scholars, and professionals across dozens of disciplines, some of which he co-founded. An enthusiastic world traveler into his late 80s, Stan's circles of friends has included famous actors, artists, musicians, political activists, scientists, shamans, psychics, and beyond. And he has gathered dozens of accolades and significant awards from professional and lay societies. This is a fascinating story, a fascinating life story, well worth reading. Let's welcome Stanley here today. Hi, Stanley. Oh my God, thank you. How can I possibly live up to that introduction? I think there's even more. That was a shortened version of all the accomplishments you have. The first question that I always like to ask, and you can take your time and answer however long you want, is what about your childhood? Can you tell us about where you grew up and whether it brought you to this path you have been on in the field of psychology? This is one reason that I thought writing my memoirs would be helpful because my uh, later endeavors and professional life was all based upon the experiences that I had very, very early in life. Mm -hmm. I have always been very, very curious and my father and my mother were certainly very enthusiastic in terms of helping me investigate, study, and travel on topics that I was interested in. None of us, of course, ever dreamed it would end up the way it did, but uh, the seeds were certainly planted in my childhood, mm -hmm. and you've read the memoir, so you know I grew up on a farm, which was pretty much isolated from the big cities and the foreign countries that I visited later. But even so, there was plenty to study and investigate to sate my curiosity in terms of, first of all, being out in nature, being aware of the ups and downs of natural cycles and animal life and even bird life. So that was the basic groundwork. So was that was that in the Midwest or where did you grow that up? Was a, yes, that was yes, that was in Wisconsin, that's right. Mm -hmm. In Wisconsin, what city? Well, we lived on a farm. The closest small city was Fort Atkinson, named after General Atkinson, who was a general in the Black Hawk War. And when I investigated the Black Hawk War, that got me interested in Native American history. Mm -hmm. And also, my father would give me arrowheads that he unearthed when he was plowing the fields with a horse and plow, which they did in my childhood. And so those arrowheads really launched my 
they are interested in shamanism. Wow. Also, my mother insisted on giving me stuff that I could put in scrapbooks. And I don't know why she did that, but I'm glad she did, because that provided me with the specific dates, details of places of what I was able to write about decades later. Mm -hmm. So really the seeds of your book writing and things you were doing were really starting in your childhood as seeds were being planted with arrowheads and the idea of collecting things and keeping a little scrapbook of what you were doing at that time. It sounds like you had very thoughtful parents. Oh, good heavens, yes. I was very, very fortunate. And as I was writing my memoirs, I became even more aware of my good fortune. And also, of course, I had a very wonderful sister who she and I have always had a very close relationship. So despite all of the vicissitudes and challenges in my later life, at least I had a good grounding in family. And you were also experiencing what it is when you said the cycles, where nowadays children have no idea how you get a, an ear of corn or a tomato. It just comes out of a store. You were actually learning the whole cycle of life and growth and being able to find out where your food actually came from. And did you raise animals there that you used for milk or meat or? Actually, our farm was basically an orchard. Oh. And my grandfather had planted a whole variety of apple trees, also uh, trees for cherries, plums, other other items like that. We did have one or two cows, and that provided us with milk. We would not take the milk directly from the cows. It all had to go to be pasteurized first and then return to us. So that was another cycle. And I was actually in charge of the vegetable garden on our farm. And so I was able to plant things and watch them grow. And I delighted in growing items that our neighbors had never heard of, called rabbi, for example, and kale, berries. And so that got me interested and some of the more unusual types of vegetables. And also, in the little forest in the back of our house, we had wild berries that I would go and harvest them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I had, I was very lucky, I had very, very close contact with nature while I was growing up. And you also, I think that that good foundation of eating healthy food that was coming from the ground and your trees could be one of the reasons that you've lived this long life past 90 years old now. You've got a good, healthy body to start with. Well, I think you're right. Uh, my father introduced me to a type of supplement called Nutralite, which provided a lot of basic minerals and vegetables. And so in addition to the good food, I also had supplements from an early age. Mm -hmm. And I think that that did provide a very, very basic foundation. Now, along with that, as you might recall, I was not very healthy as a child. I had any number of childhood disabilities and interests and illnesses, and I can remember being awake at night, coughing and wheezing, and my father and mother were gathered around, not knowing if I would be alive or dead. Oh my! In the morning, oh yes, it was very, very serious, and I can remember many of the precautions that they took. But the precaution did not inhibit me, nor them, from getting me involved in various 
youth groups and uh, clubs, and they would take me to the 4-H club. The 4-H clubs to this day are a very popular pastime for farm children. Yes. And also took me to Boy Scout meetings, also took me to uh, any number of, of, of parties. So they were very, very, shall we say, insistent on getting me involved with people. This is important because I had such a rich inner life in terms of reading and in terms of uh, looking at encyclopedia that they had to actually push me. They kept saying, you've got to learn how to be with people. Yes, thank you, mother and father. And that also is a very important part of my life. And I, I really feel like that is a foundation because you've gone around the world and spoken to people everywhere. So they, your parents would be so proud of how much of a social life you actually have. You're always busy. And uh, I think that they did a good job in making sure that you didn't just stick your head in a book. It's a, they, they did a great job for you there. I, um, I was wondering why is it that um, you chose to work in psychology? Do you have any pivotal point or uh, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm wondering, was there a, a set time in your life or did your parents guide you toward a lot of education? They were really on a farm. How did you get involved in psychology? I was always very curious about people's behavior. And even though we were in a rural community, away from huge big cities, there was a lot of activity that puzzled me. Mm -hmm. For example, there was a neighbor girl who disappeared, kidnapped. And they had pictures of her on the front page of the newspaper for three years until it was discovered by somebody in jail that he had murdered the poor girl. And that was actually a very seminal part of my life because far from being an idyllic, uh, upbeat uh, community, there was that too, but there were also other examples. There was a couple who came to church every Sunday, and I could see that the wife came with black and blue marks on her face, tried to cover them up with makeup, and I knew that her husband had been beating her. And mm -hmm. I asked my mother about it. Well, we don't interfere with other people's business. Well, then I knew she was being beaten. Yes. Yes. Also, there was, oh, good heavens, I just go on and on and on. Uh, I, I knew cases of incest, infidelities, uh, scandals. Even in a small town, there was a scandal. The leading lawyer in town was having a romance with his secretary and his wife couldn't do anything about it. She just coped as best she could. And so that also interested me. So there were a lot of personal events and interpersonal events that I just didn't take for granted. I was very curious why people behaved the way they did. And that's a you know, when you look on the outside, you see this idyllic farm country, small town. You never expect those other kind of situations to be in there. So when we talk about, uh, you know, a child being abducted, of a, of a woman being beaten, these are things we think of more in a big city. So it was really a good focus for you to be able to see these things going on and not not be in an illusion that the light, that there's also the shadowy part of life. You know, several years ago, there was a very popular movie on television called Pays and Place, the scandalous behaviors in a small town. And when that aired on television, I thought, well, my little town was a regular Payton Place with all of these scandals going on. So um, 
It wasn't a stretch of imagination at all for them to rape, rape and police. And you, so this is where psychology was intriguing to you already because you were wondering why did these people behave this way? Or what was the reasons that brought them to this type of behavior? So really your background and childhood were things that led you to choose psychology as a path. Yes, that's right. Now, when I was in high school, I had another seminal event. All these years, without knowing it, I had a speech impediment, a frontal lisp. Mm -hmm. And I was teased for it, didn't know how to manage it. When I was in high school on the debate team, we had a judge from the University of Wisconsin come to evaluate the team. And he noticed my lisp. And he taught me how to put my tongue in back of my teeth when I was making S and Z sounds. Changed my life. Within wow. a week, I had lost my lisp. And so my first professional engagement was as a speech therapist. And as a speech therapist, of course, that segued into a lot of personal dynamics. And then when I went off to graduate school at Northwestern University, I was able to take more courses in psychology. And that led to three years at Kent State University, where I was teaching courses on educational psychology. And I could have remained at Kent State University for the rest of my career had it not been for the intrusion of parapsychological phenomena. Uh -huh. And that had been sort of a hobby of mine. And I was an early member of the Parapsychological Association, which was just getting started by J.B. Ryan and Louisa E. Ryan at Duke University. And that was a hobby of mine. And then I was invited to go to Brooklyn, New York and run a dream research laboratory at Maimonides Medical Center where we would study dreams that had some sort of parapsychological component to it. And so I left this very safe and secure job for a very uncertain and, uh, shall we say, unsafe vocation, which had its ups and downs, but it kept me in New York City for 10 years. Now, so what year were we talking about when you met J.B. Ryan and started getting involved in parapsychology? Was that the late 40s or early that, 50s? That was in the, in the ninth, late 1950s. When I was at the University of Wisconsin, had another seminal event. The Wisconsin Student Union was very unique because the committees were all student-run and student-managed. And I applied for the forum committee, which invited guests to the campus. And within a year, I was chairman of the forum committee. And so I wanted to invite J.B. Ryan to give a lecture on parapsychology. And we could give no faculty support for it. One of the people who heard our request said, well, if you invite J.B. Ryan to talk, their next talk should be about a faith healer talking about recent advances in the art of healing. Yes, we had uh, uh, no support from those members of the faculty, but we invited him anyway. And the student who was supposed to introduce him Check it out because he was afraid of getting into trouble with a psychology professor. So I introduced J.B. Ryan myself, and then he invited me to visit him at Duke University. It took me three years, but I finally got there. And that visit, of course, also changed my life because I began to interact with the luminaries in the parapsychology field. 
So J.B. Ryan was someone who opened up doors for you to be able to meet other people in the parapsychology field. And uh, you decided to, where was he, J.B. Ryan? Was that, what state was he in? He was at Duke University, North Carolina. North Carolina. And then early on, I met Dr. Gardner Murphy, one of the eminent psychologists of the 20th century. And he took a great interest in me and fostered me. And so between J.B. Ryan and Gardner Murphy, I had the best possible mentors and initiators for my work in parapsychology. I should mention one thing. I was asked by J.B. Ryan to investigate a report that he had about poltergeist activity in the state of Iowa. And so a friend of mine and I drove to Iowa to investigate the poltergeist mm -hmm. and the house where all these things were happening uh, was being ransacked by, by sightseers because the elderly couple who were living in the house couldn't take the publicity, couldn't take the noise and moved out of it. But when we got to the house, we found that all of these reports of strange activities had very simple, natural explanations. Mm -hmm. There was a grandson living with his parents, and he was sick and tired of being babysitter for his parents, for his grandparents. And so he arranged to have strange noises happen, strange objects flying across the room, all initiated by him, but it scared his parents. And when we told his parents and grandparents that said, no, we never thought of that. Well, obviously, uh, our explanation is correct because after they confronted him, the disappearance, the, the noises and strange objects disappeared. So that was a good, a good experience in seeing what it's like when someone tries to fake a poltergeist. Oh, good heavens, yes. Yeah. So my, my, journey has always been to find the simplest possible explanation for unusual phenomena. Mm -hmm. And if the simple one doesn't explain, then you have to match it up a bit and look for a little more complicated explanation. And when you were doing the work at Maimondes, um, was it where, were you, were you trying to see about like, um, you know, like when we dream precognitively, or was, was that the idea, like people who dream things that haven't happened yet, but then it does happen? Or were you just trying to figure out how the dream actually works or how much we dream? Or what kind of, what was your goal there in the, and, and you, did you take, you took a risk, you gave up all of this secure job and took a risk to go into this other field that isn't as uh, uh, respected, but you took that risk and it really worked out for your whole life. Well, one never knows, but you're right. We never knew from one year to the next if we would have money to continue the work. And our basic research paradigm was actually very, very simple. We had a dreamer come to the laboratory and have dinner with the person who was going to be sending him or her a message. And then the two of them separated and then one of our researchers threw dice, and the number on the dice directed him or her to an envelope. And in the envelope, there was a art print, a picture, usually a very colorful, emotional picture. And he would take this to a private room, and from time to time during the night, he would focus on trying to send the picture to the dreamer. Aye. At the same time, the dreamer, of course, is fast asleep, but the dreamer's orientation was to sort of reach out and get the image. And then when the rapid eye movements ended, the experiment would speak to the microphone, tell me what's been going through your mind. And then we would almost always get a dream. So we had the dream, and then we had outside judges who were not present at the time look at all of the potential pictures, try to match them with the dreams, 
And they were able to do this far better than you would expect by chance. Mm -hmm. And that was, the, so that was 10 years you were in Brooklyn doing that work? That was, yes, I was, I was doing that work for 10 years. And during that period of time, we actually concluded about a dozen experiments. Of course, this is very time intensive and even cost ineffective because you spend all night trying to get one little bit of data. And so it was major investment of time, but it paid off. Just a few years ago, there was a statistical meta-analysis, in other words, an analysis of uh, many, many different reports. After our work at Maimonides ended, other laboratories tried to repeat the work, and the meta-analysis showed that the repetitions were more often than not confirming and successfully repeating what we had done with Maimonides. So our work was very intensive, but I am happy to say that I probably and my colleague Montague Ullman, who initiated the whole project, and I wrote probably two dozen articles in scientific journals, some of the leading psychiatric journals, as well as the parapsychological journals. So that's all part of the research literature now. Well, that sounds like that was a successful thing, and you made a good choice to go and spend some time in New York. Yes, let me give you just an example for your listeners and viewers. Okay. One night, the picture that came up randomly was a picture of a Mexican army Revolutionary Army walking through the uh, mountains. Mm -hmm. A very, very dramatic picture indeed. And the dreamer had a dream about Mexico, about an army, and about war. Three different wow. dreams. Yeah, all of them closely associated to the picture. So when the outside judges looked at all of the pictures, it was very easy for them to match that picture with the night of dreams. So that is the way that we ran the experiment and did the statistics. I'm, I've always wanted to know the answer to that. So I'm really, really glad you explained it. I, um, uh, I have a, another question here about your career. Was that, I'm not sure if your dream lab is, but in your lengthy career of all these decades, is there any particular time that you feel was the most rewarding work in your career? Well, there are several ways that I could actually answer that. I think that the work in the dream laboratory at Maimonides Medical Center was probably the most rewarding work of my career. For one thing, it was very enjoyable and very challenging because we had a number of volunteers coming to help out and that made the task much simpler for us. And also, it was a very, very pioneering and historic effort, you might say. And the working of Maimonides was put into a popular book by Monty Rome and myself. And this year, 2023, was the 50th anniversary of the publication of the Dream Telepathy book. And so they republished it with all the original pictures and accolades. And so it was not forgotten. 
That's that's very wonderful. And in fact, all of your work, um, didn't you find a particular university that will house everything that you've done so that none of your work will be lost uh, for future generations? Oh, good heavens, much to my surprise. Much to my surprise. University of West Georgia wanted all of my personal memorabilia. Rice University in Houston, Texas wanted all my professional writings. So between the two universities, everything that I have saved will go into the archives. Yeah, this is again is a tribute to my mother who got me to keep scrapbooks. And so I've kept very good records of everything. And without those archives, all of that would have been lost when I die. But now they're already already archived for anybody that wants to do research and find them. It's all there. That's I'm, just, I'm so happy for you for that. And I'm so glad that you, you got to be part of getting that out to the universities. I'm... Uh, I'm glad that we spoke about the dream workshop. And I, the one thing I wondered about that is, is that was that the first time dreams were studied this way, or was this a groundbreaking work that had never really been done before by researchers? Were you the first to do this type of work? Well, we were the first ones to do it in a sleep laboratory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, over the years there had been a few attempts, and that's all part of the research literature, a few attempts of people to study dreams and to look for telepathic or precognitive elements in the dreams. And so there were pioneers who did this even before the days of sleep laboratories. But yes, we brought all of that into a sleep laboratory for the first time. But like I say, there's now probably been a dozen other sleep laboratories who have replicated the work. Not always successful replications, but more often than not successful replications. That's wonderful. So I'm going to move on here to another question and take as much time as you need to answer this. What did you learn about yourself and the incredible life you have lived after you wrote this book? I mean, to sit down and put in hundreds and hundreds of pages of your life, you had to comb through so much. And I'm wondering um, uh, how that was for you. Well, it's very easy to answer that question. After going all over, all over this, one reaction I had, how could I possibly have been so stupid? <laughs> How could I have made so many mistakes? How could I have done that? How could going back over those years, good heavens, it's a wonder I'm still functioning after so many mistakes. Uh, I shouldn't be overly dramatic, but uh, it really was quite a wake up call for me. Yes, I remember all the positive things. But for the sake of my memoirs, I certainly didn't want to leave out, leave out the uh, the stupidity and the misadventures and the shortcomings that also have been a part of my life. So, so writing the book was a teaching for you as well as sharing your life with everyone else. Oh, good heavens, yes! I, you always hear people say. If I could do it again, I would do it exactly the same. Not me. I would do it completely very, very differently. <laughs> of course, you don't have that chance. You have to make the best of what you have to make the best use of the cards that are dealt to you. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, and do the best that you can with them. And I believe you have done this. Um, well, what were your biggest challenges in writing about your diverse life and, and career? Did you, I'm not sure how, it seemed you wrote the book very, fairly fast. And I'm wondering were there any difficulties or challenges along the way when you were writing? I actually had a 
two-year deadline and the two-year deadline ended on July 1st of this year, 2023, and I was able to make the deadline, mm -hmm. and it came to 50 chapters, probably too long. I don't know if anybody will want to read 50 chapters, but the university professor's press didn't give me a page limit or a word limit. I kept on writing, and then I had 50 chapters. No, that's the end. That's the end. No more than 50 chapters. So on July 1st, everything was finished. Well, I think that's an incredible accomplishment for you to be able to do that amount of writing. And then the research in your mind of remembering all the different incidental stories and history of things that you lived through. I actually have a very, very poor memory for dates, mm -hmm. but I have a very, very good memory for events that had an emotional component to them, both positive and negative. So I was going through writing the book. Sometimes I could remember in great detail events, people, places, excruciating detail from time to time with the taste, the smells, the colors, all of that. I really surprised myself that I could remember all of that. And I'm not bragging because dates I could not remember at all. If I remember the decade, I was lucky to do that. Well, I think your memory is phenomenal. And all of us would be thrilled if we could have a sharper memory in mind as you as we go into the next sections of life here. I, 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 have, two, I have a personal question I'd like to ask now which is of the many amazing people you write about in your book, A Chaotic Life, there is one person so near and dear to me who has passed on, but can you tell our listeners about how did you meet Jean Millay? And can you tell us some stories about you two and how you impacted each other's lives? Oh, good heavens, Jean Millay was an incredible woman. As you know, you knew her too. Yes. And so I, I devote a lot of time and space to her in the book because she came out of nowhere and wanted to volunteer for our dream telepathy experiments. Mm -hmm. And she not only was highly psychic herself, but she was able to introduced me to people that I would have not met any other way because of her background in art. And also, she was a true psychedelic pioneer. We called her the Acid Queen. <laughs> I never heard that. Oh, yes, yes. Wonderful. yes, she was. Yes, she was. And good heavens, there's many stories I could tell about Jean Millay, but I'll mention just one of them. She invited me to a birthday party for her friend Ala Raka, the famous tabla player from India. And at that birthday party, who should show up but one of his students, Mickey Hart. And I had just seen Mickey Hart on stage at the Grateful Dead a few nights earlier. Uh huh. Yes, and this is quite a remarkable story because when Mickey came to the party, he came to meet me because he wanted to learn about hypnosis. And I, of course, didn't know who he was. He was very dramatically dressed in a black and white harlequin suit and a black ponytail. And we went off to a private room to talk about hypnosis because he was teaching his students how to play tabla and other instruments, and he was hypnotizing them. So he told me what he was doing, and I gave him some tips so he would not give them any harm. He was just about to leave the door, and he said, by the way, you like rock music. I love rock music. I just heard The Grateful Dead three nights ago. He said, well, then you heard me play. Oh, how fun. <laughs> yes. Three words that changed my life. Do you like rock music? So that 
introduced me to the Grateful Dead and all of the wonderful experiences I've had over the years with the Grateful Dead. And that put me in touch with a whole other group of people, including the legendary Jerry Garcia. And that would never have happened had it not been for Gene Millay's invitation to the party. I want to add a little snippets of a few things I might know. First of all, Mickey Hart lives right down the road from me, about two miles from where I live. And uh, he's been in our uh, community for many years. And Jean uh, had mentioned that she was doing the first light shows, I believe, for the Grateful Dead, where you they where she was dropping things on, you know, liquid or different things on there to show the amazing light shows. And I guess they had played on the roof of her house in Southern California once. Yes. And um, uh, she had so many amazing stories to, to tell about that, which it's almost, it's psychic, like you were reading my questions because my next question was about the Grateful Dead and your involvement with Mickey Hart. But I'd like to step back a little to the Jean Millay before on and some sort of personal things that may be the two, a story that the two of you have with each other. Because I know you did wonderful things. She always said to me that, you invited her to, I think, or suggested or something about her doing a art show at the Museum of Modern Art. And I think she, I, unless I'm wrong about this history, I she credited you for being the person for her to get encouraged to be able to show her light sculpture. Well, yes, Jean was very talented. Not only was she a pioneer in terms of light shows, uh, the Grateful Dead, Holy Model Round or several other people she did live shows for. And she created a remarkable plastic mandala that had colored fluids going through a circular maze so that if people had their headphones on and could listen to music, the light show would synchronize with what they were listening to. It was really quite a pioneering effort. And we actually did a parapsychology uh, test with her with that particular light sculpture. Also, Jean was a early pioneer in biofeedback. And Jean was very technically adept. And so she was able to master biofeedback, which involves getting feedback about your brain waves, And she could slow her brain waves down, speed her brain waves up. And sometimes she did in front of audiences where they would see on a screen the results of what she was doing. And they could see when the brain waves were fast, when they were slow, just through her uh, control of her own mental processes. Yeah, so that's another one of Jean's contributions. She, she was a she. Also, I should mention, Jean was one of my students for her PhD, and she wrote a very interesting dissertation about people who are close emotionally, and one would be a sender, one would be receiver on a telepathy test. And then she got her dissertation done, and it was the results are highly significant statistically. And she was really frustrated because I said, Gee, you're going to have to make a great sacrifice to do this dissertation. You're going to have to stay away from marijuana. <laughs> oh, what a sacrifice! <laughs> And she could not, obviously, she could not write and be stoned at the same time. Mm -hmm. The way it was, she always reminded me, I had to re rewrite my dissertation six times to make you happy. Oh. <laughs> yeah, But she did, and she actually published her dissertation as a book, Multidimensional Mind. So it's there if anybody wants to read it, yes. I... Yeah, she, she's one of the many remarkable people I've met, right? And she was the one, when you had invited me to join a group do, doing table tipping, 
and I had no information about what table tipping is or what was I supposed to do and did this really work or, you know, is this just something that's a parlor game? She was the one who said to me, you're contacting spirit and you're communicating to spirit through the table. And uh, it was in one of our visits that she had she had told me that and we were going to maybe have her come join us, but she passed away before we could do any other interaction. And um, I was very grateful for her to give me the, the guidance that I'm connecting to spirits in this. And um, when we speak about um, uh, her life and her experiences with, with, with acid, when you tell, I never heard that she was called the acid queen, but she did do something I had shared with you at our table tipping, which was that in her passing in last hours and two days of life, she spent it on actual acid that was from the 60s and she couldn't swallow. So that she actually had it crushed and put into her feeding tube. And she had to be a very powerful, strong person to ask for that in her dying time for that way, this was the way that she would like to pass. And I never, I've heard people say that, but she's the only actual person I know who actually did this. Mm -hmm. That's fair. That, that quite possible. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And, may, and Aldous Huxley, maybe. I'm just saying that's, <laughs> she, she was, she was quite an amazing woman. And yes. it's because of her that you came into my life. So I'm so grateful to be your friend. And if it wasn't for Jean, I don't know that we'd have gotten to know each other. So that's right. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you, Jean, wherever she is, that yes. she she brought the two of us together. So she brought famous people into your life and she brought little somebody like me. <laughs> that's right. Also, I'm still in touch with Jean's daughter, Maya, who lives in Hawaii. And on a very, very beautiful farm where she grows exotic flowers and exotic birds. Yes. Uh, yes, she's quite a talent on her own right. And I see her whenever I get to Hawaii, right? Yes, and because of after losing uh, Jean, I've gotten connected to, my, my, to, 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 um, to her also now. And Mara and I are friends. Mm -hmm. And we send each other, I just sent her a whole package with jams and jellies and dried fruits. And she sends me her homegrown vanilla beans. Mm -hmm. And it's the way that I feel like I still have a little piece of gene in my life. Yes. So I'm really grateful to her daughter. And I told her we we're going to be doing this interview. And I always let her know if there's podcasts where we talk about her mom, I send her a message and say, listen to this so you can hear what we're saying about your incredible mother. Uh, so let me go on to another question here, which is, um, well, I was going to ask you about the Grateful Dead and how you met Mickey, but you've already answered that. So can you tell me, is there a favorite memory or story from your book, A Chaotic Life, that you want to share with our listeners, something that would uh, show them what kind of interesting stories they'll be reading when they purchase this book? I know there's so many. Yes, so yes. Okay. Pick, but, you, you know, I don't care if it's one or yeah. three, it's whatever you'd like to share. Okay, well, many of them. Uh, one story that I can talk about, which was, of course, very dramatic, was my meeting with Dr. Martin Luther King. Oh. Yes. And he was about to give a series of lectures um, when I was in New York City area, and actually, no, this is when I was at Northwestern University. Anyway, the point is, I went to all of his lectures, and then one day at Northwestern, I was on my way to class, and I saw him walking down the down the street. And I came up to him and told him how much I appreciated his lecture. And I said, if you want a tour of the campus, I will take you on a tour of the campus. And he did. So I had Martin Luther King to myself for half an hour. Oh. And yes. And people always say, well, 
what did you ask him? What did you want him to tell you? I said, look, I didn't want to bug him. Everything that he gave him the lectures, why should you repeat that? I told him that I would be happy to show him the campus and tell him about the university. And I only made one comment in his lecture. He had talked about his disagreement with the famous novelist Faulkner, who in his Nobel Prize winning address told civil rights people, go slow now. You've made a big advance in desegregating schools now. No, go slow now. And Mark Luther, no, you don't go slow. When you have your enemy down, you, re you intensify your efforts. And I told him, you know, that's right out of Machiavelli. I had read The Prince as part of my uh, college work, and Machiavelli gave advice to rulers and what he called the prince. And one of them, once you have made a point or even a killing, you don't step back. You keep pushing until the task is over. So that's the one piece of interaction about his work that we have. But of course, I actually met Martin Luther King again when he lectured at the University of Chicago, again when he lectured for the American Psychological Association, and both times he claimed to remember our talk and our walk at Northwestern University. I'm sure, I'm sure he did. And were his talks all about civil rights? Yes, what? Was his talks all about civil rights? Oh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. A powerful speaker, and just for you to be in his presence, two powerful speakers got to be together. <laughs> <laughs> so that was so that was that. I think I think that's an amazing, wonderful one of the many, many interesting characters that you write about in your book. Maybe I should, yes, I should tell mention a couple more. Yes, I'm sure yeah, I should mention when it. I was at the University of Wisconsin. 1954 was the year that the Supreme Court said that segregation in schools was unconstitutional. And I can remember watching this on television, watching it all unfold. And I was very intensely interested in that. One year when I was just out of, uh, of, of, uh, school as a speech therapist, I went to Richmond, Virginia, was invited to do speech therapy work at the University of Virginia, not at the University of Virginia, at the public schools in Richmond, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And I really have a lot of memories about the desegregation, segregation struggle, and our speech therapy plays a very small part. We had a speech and hearing clinic one day a week, and students would come with their parents to be tested, to be hearing tested. And we had both black and white therapists, both black and white students. Whoever got there first got paired off with somebody, it didn't matter if they were white, if they were black, the parents were just so glad to have their children tested, they didn't mind. So here, while the face of Richmond Public Schools was segregation never on the side, we were already integrating the speech and hearing clinic. Mm -hmm. So you've been around long enough to have seen all of these different changes. And in some ways, the things that were happening are still going on today. And, oh, yes. Uh, I should also mention what happened in the, during the Vietnam War. Yes. Yes, I was in the the incursion of the United States troops into Vietnam made absolutely no sense to me. And I was part of the first march, the so-called peace march of New York City, protesting the Vietnam War. And the Vietnam War eventually got closed down thanks in part to the Pentagon Papers 
which were uh, surreptitiously photocopied and leaked to the press. Um, and the staff member who did that was asked to write a book about the Pentagon Papers. And he said, well, I've never written a book. And they said, have to talk to Stanley Crypto. He's written more books than anybody. <laughs> That's so, true. Yeah, so we had a meeting. And all the advice he'd gotten in the past didn't make sense to me. They were saying, write an outline. That, no, that's the top-down approach. You've got to take the bottom-up approach. Just write anything. Write a sentence. Then write another sentence. Write another sentence. And that worked. That worked. And on my 70th birthday party in Berkeley, he was invited. And he told everybody about how I had helped to write the Pentagon Papers. I only told one or two people about that, but said it was all out in the open. And uh, so that's a, another part of my memoirs, the little vignette. That's, that's well, that, that that's, all these stories, listeners, are all in uh, the memoir. When you pick it up to read, you'll get to hear many, many stories. And I'm enjoying these stories very much. Um, what effect are you hoping your readers will have after reading your life story? You know, one effect I was hoping that I would have would be encouraging more people to do this type of writing. And I've succeeded. Three people who started reading my memoirs have now begun to write their own memoirs. Why is this important? Because we're living in very dramatic world shaking times. And so the more people that write their own stories covering their perspective of the times we're living in, the better. This is important historically. So that's one effect. Also, I just hope that people will get some enjoyment uh, in one form or another from reading it. And I've written the 50 chapters in a way so that each chapter stands on its own. Mm -hmm. If a chapter doesn't interest somebody, they can just pass on to another chapter. So each chapter is sort of a little book by itself. So we've talked about, let's see, a famous musician, a famous political activist. Were there any uh, actors or Hollywood kind of people that came into your life? Did you write about anybody like this in your book about any other, you know, anyone else in the famous world out there other than musician? Oh, good heavens, yes, there's so many of them. Of course, my contact with Frank Lloyd Wright was very seminal for me. Oh, my goodness. The famous architect. Uh, right now, I'm looking at my wall, and I have an autographed picture of him on my wall. And when I was at the University of Wisconsin, as chairman of the forum committee, I did an outrageous thing. I said, let's invite Frank Lloyd Wright. Oh, no, he's so famous, he would never come in. Yeah, but he spent a whole semester at the University of Wisconsin. He might want to return. And much to my delight, I got a letter back. This is the days before email, uh, saying, seeing I am so close, I will come on the provision that no admission charge be made. Well, blew my mind. So of course we didn't charge admissions. Of course the auditorium was filled. And we had dinner with Frank Lloyd Wright and his wife. And a number of interesting things happened at the dinner. But one thing, his wife, Olga Viana, was a very renowned person in her own right. She was from the Gurdjieff tradition. And I thought it'd be interesting for people to talk with her and we put her at the far end of the table. And she sat down and she said, I just hope we don't engage in small talk. <laughs> and the students were so uh, afraid to say anything. 
that they didn't talk during the whole entire meal. <laughs> and Frank Lloyd Wright was very angry. How can you separate a man from his wife? Sorry. It got off to a poor start. But then a very important thing happened at the dinner. Uh, he was asking about the plans of the members of the committee. And one of them said, well, you know, the plans are uh, up in the air because I'm afraid I might be drafted and sent off to war. That was the days of the Korean War. And Frank Lloyd Wright said, well, you just don't go. What do you mean don't go? You always have a choice, Frank Lloyd Wright said. You can go to jail and you can leave the country, but you have a choice. Blew my mind. Mm -hmm. And I remembered that when I've given that advice to other people, especially during the days of the Vietnam War, when students started to come to me Say, what choice do I have? I don't want to go into the army and go off to Vietnam. Did you always have a choice? I will write a letter for you on my Maimonides Medical Center stationery saying that you're not eligible for the draft because you are either homosexual, sociopath, or drug addict, or all three. Mm -hmm. And I got a dozen people out of the draft that way, all thanks to Frank Lloyd Ryan's advice. I I'm so happy to hear that. I feel like the, I have little pieces of these things. In, in I, I was at one of those large demonstrations in New York against the war in Vietnam. And I think we, I was in seventh grade. I think I was 13, 13 years old. And our teachers all were going to, to the demonstration, but they couldn't let the school know. So the teachers said to us, just meet us on the corner a block away and we'll all go together. So our teachers and, the, and us young students all headed on the train to Manhattan to join in the demonstrations. And um, uh, I had a life in Wisconsin, which I guess I'll talk about with you later when we're not on the show, but I did get to stay in a Frank Lloyd Wright house there because one of my father-in-law's friends had him build one there. And it was on Lake, um, uh, what's the name of the lake? not in Sheboygan, Elkhart Lake. It was in Elkhart Lake and a beautiful uh, Frank Lloyd Wright house and just beautifully built. So you've rubbed elbows with some other interesting characters besides this. Uh, so now we spoke about um, Ala Raka, who was uh, the drummer of uh, Ravi Shankar. Ravi Shankar, yes. Yeah. And we spoke about Mickey Hart, the drummer, consequently also the drummer of The Grateful Dead. And we spoke about Dr. Martin Luther King and Frank Lloyd Wright. So can we hit upon one more? Uh, oh, Laura Huxley. Was a very, very, Laura Huxley was a very good friend of mine. Ah. Yes. And um, as you mentioned earlier, Aldous Huxley, when he was dying, was administered LSD by his wife, Laura. And she discusses that in her book, This Timeless Moment. So I knew a lot about her before we met. And once we met, we just had so much in common, such an incredible person, and such a gifted writer and activist of her own right. I was actually very honored to invite be invited to her 90th birthday party. And before that, I had helped her draft a little book about children our most precious legacy. And um, she was brilliant and charming and fascinating. And again, that's one of my, uh, actually one of my favorite celebrities that I've interacted with over the years. And there's one more where when I've been to your home, you showed me on your wall what's your most prized possession and it was the uh, visit you went to, is it Switzerland, to see Albert Hoffman? Yes. So could you just tell about that little? Oh, good heavens. Yes, yes I have a favorite. I have a, a, a piece of paper on which he wrote the formula for LSD. And it's, of course, my most prized possession. I just hope it doesn't get stolen by anybody. But that's uh, through my good friend, Stanley 
up there, and then there is the LSD molecule. I have I, never in a million years did I think I would ever meet Albert Hoffman. And back in the early days of psychedelic research, I was fascinated by an article in Life magazine about Maria Sabina, the shaman who actually introduced the world to the magic mushrooms. Never think that I would ever meet her. And the article was so fascinating. This was half a century ago or more, where I followed up on that every chance that I had. And then when the Harvard experiments started with Timothy Leary, I thought, oh, I would love to be part of that experiments. Mm -hmm. And I wrote to a friend of mine at Harvard, Steve Kleinberg, who's now a famous professor at Rice University. And I said, you've got to volunteer for that experiment. And then you've got to have them invite me, which he did. And so I found myself at Harvard with a face-to-face -face interview with Timothy Leary. And after the interview, he said, you're just the person, the type of person I want to be part of the experiment. Fine. By the way, I'm having a dinner party for Alan Watts tonight. Can you come? I said, I'd love to come. And that's how I met Alan Watts, who played such an important part of my life. Good heavens, I could have written a whole book about Alan Watts, but uh, he makes several appearances in my book. So anyway, uh, we went to the dinner party. It was a potluck. And I ate something that didn't agree with me. I got to my friend Steve Feinberg's apartment, and I threw up. I threw up all night. I was so sick, domain poisoning. And I said, I'm not going to miss the event tomorrow. You would have to take me there early and then just have me sit down for the interview, which he did. And this was with Timothy Leary's assistance. I did the interview, and as soon as they left, I ran to the bathroom and threw up. <laughs> yes, and then a few hours later, there I was, back at the apartment, taking psilocybin, and Tim gave us the psilocybin, and then he left, and his students ran the show. In half an hour, all of my sickness disappeared. Uh, oh, yes, I felt fine. I had an incredible time, and that was my initiatory experience with LSD. And then some strange things happened because I was invited to give a talk at a shamanism conference, and Albert Hoffman was one of the speakers. That's how I met Albert Hoffman at this shamanism conference in, in Switzerland. And I invited my friend Rolling Thunder, the Native American medicine man, to the conference. And Albert Hoffman and I really hit it off. I don't know what he saw in me, but we had a great time. We saw each other at conferences over the years. And then when he invited me to visit him in his home, he said, I do not want to put the address in a letter, but here's the phone number. When you get to Basil, phone and I'll give you directions, which I did. And sure enough, my German friends and I made the phone call and Albert Hoffman and his wife Erica lived in this charming house overlooking fields and forests. And that is when he gave me the autographed uh, uh, picture, the uh, autographed uh, LSD molecule, yes. And then, of course, I was invited to his 100th birthday party a few years later. Much to my surprise, they put me on the program three times uh. to discuss, yes, LSD and religion, LSD in politics, LSD in art. And I said, too much. I'm going to devote one of those sessions 
to some friends of mine who should have been invited to give talk but weren't. So I had friends of mine from, let's see, Mexico and Colombia and another part of the United States uh, make some presentations. So sort of spread spread the wealth a little bit. So, well, yes, that, and, and that was uh, Albert Hoffman would be my candidate for sainthood if I were into sainthood. He was a very, very spiritual person. Mm -hmm. And he was so closely attuned to nature. Lived just, as I say, out in the country with the forest in view. And that harkened back to my own immersion in nature as a child. So, happens to say, I have nothing but incredible and even poignant memories of our time together. Did you have any more interactions with Timothy Leary, or was it just when you participated in the experiments at Harvard? Oh, your listeners will have to read the book to find out. Okay. Oh, good heavens, I had, I knew Timothy Leary through his years in prison uh, and after prison. I, yeah, the last time I saw him was when both of us were lecturing at, in Encinitas, California, the, uh, University of Human Science. And he lived very nearby. And he was very honored that they would want him to speak. So he spoke there several times. And oftentimes we were on the same program together. And I could tell many stories about Timothy Leary, but one that I think is pertinent, I was with Timothy Leary when some students from MIT, this was when he was just out of Harvard, came to his house to visit him, and they wanted to tell him about marijuana. And they said, it's not the addictive drug that people are saying. We use it to alter our consciousness. That was the first time that Timothy heard that about marijuana. Wow. Yes. And so he started to dabble with marijuana, uh, got to the point where he advocated LSD once a week, marijuana once a day. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I was never that indulgent. But uh, then sometime later, I was at a party with Timothy Leary, and they were passing around a joint. That was my first time I smoked marijuana. Yes. So your first acid was with him and your first marijuana was with him. That's right, yes. So mm -hmm. I'm sure he's around in your book and I'll have to just share my quick Timothy Leary story, which is he was a very good friend of what was gonna end up becoming my husband, but we didn't know that then. And uh, he invited David. He invited David and I to visit him down in Beverly Hills, where he was the last place where he was living. And when we went to meet him, he was doing some sort of a video. He was like a voice and a part of a video game that someone was making. So they, he asked us to meet him in this little scary place in Los Angeles. And uh, I was the person driving. So he got in the car and he we we were driving back to his house and we asked him something about, you know, do you drive or do you he said, I've never had a license. He said, I just drive, you know, <laughs> I don't use it, I don't use a license. And then when we got to his house, he was so sweet and he was making little appetizers for David and I. And he had just come across um a photo in some article in a magazine that was actually the prison cell he had been in. And so he took out this photo and he told us all his stories about being in prison and how it was the best thing that had ever happened to him because he could really focus and he learned so much. And he shared this story about how he couldn't understand why there was no alcohol. He said, in prison, you could get any drug you wanted as a prisoner, <laughs> any drug you wanted. 
He said, but you couldn't get alcohol. So he said at night he snuck into the kitchen or whatever. I don't think it must have been a minimum security kind of place. And he started to make alcohol. I don't know if it was from raisins or what <laughs> he made it, but he made alcohol. And the prisoners all drank the alcohol. And it ended up in erupting in violence and other things, what he called the Republican drug. And he said on all the other drugs, the street drugs, the marijuana, the LSD, the, the prisoners were very calm and wonderful. But as soon as the alcohol got introduced, that's where violence and anger came out. And he said, now oh. I know why they don't allow alcohol, while no one can smuggle that in or get that in, into prisons. And then at the end of this, the whole time he was sitting there and he was stroking my leg and he turned to, to David and he said, you should marry this woman. Oh, I, oh. I said, I said, well, I don't know. I don't think I want to get married, you know? And he oh. said, well, David, if she won't marry you, then just adopt her. <laughs> <laughs> so when David asked me to marry him, maybe it must've been a year later from that time, uh, we asked Timothy if he would be the minister to do our wedding. Oh. Mm -hmm. And we had a whole hippie wedding prepared, you know, with flowers and flowers on my hair. And we were wearing all these kind of things. And the dress for our wedding was tie dye and 60s clothing. But four days before our wedding, and I'd already sent him the airplane tickets to fly and he was going to bring his granddaughter or someone with him. And he contracted hepatitis. And he was just oh. too sick to, to be able to come up and marry us. Mm -hmm. But the introduction to him and the nice relationship I had, I met him the day that he was given the information that he didn't have a long time to live now. Mm -hmm. And we had an absolutely wonderful time together. And I had incredible dreams about him. And he was the only person I knew that I could feel that I could share the dreams because they were dreams about him after he passed. And in my dream, he was coming to me as a deceased person. And you can't really tell that to other people, but to him, I could. And so when I left him my dream, dreams about him, he said, I love those dreams. Oh. So I was just really, really happy to have that. And I was really happy to know that he was really the first person who planted into David that he should marry me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's now that's been over 30 years. Mm -hmm. So he made a good pick, Timothy. <laughs> well, uh, yes. Timothy Leary, of course, is a historical personage right now. And it's quite a change from the days when he was called public enemy number one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was excoriated. And in all fairness, I have to say, I think that Tim went off the deep end and probably slow down the eventual integration of psychedelics into psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. So, but I have a long tradition of that. I get along with people and sometimes we have very severe disagreements, but you know, friendship goes deeper than the disagreements. Albert Ellis, one of my great and good friends, the founder of cognitive behavioral psychotherapy was very negative about parapsychology. But we were friends nonetheless. He even invited me to speak about our dream telepathy experiments at his center in New York City. And now I'm a equally good terms with his wife, Debbie Ellis. And she and I have fewer disagreements on that topic. <laughs> well, it's wonderful to know that of course, you can keep friendships and not agree on the same things. That's what makes us all different, and and that makes what the that's what makes it more interesting. If everybody agreed with everything everyone said, that'd be kind of boring. Oh yes, back at the University of Wisconsin, my best friend was Don Taylor, who was active in the Young Republicans and was a staunch defender of Senator Joseph McCarthy, who back in those days was denouncing people as being communists without any evidence at all. And so Don took me to have a, to, to hear McCarthy. And 
when he introduced me, McCarthy gave me his newspaper and said, hang on to the newspaper while I give my talk. Well, anybody else would have saved the newspaper as a memento, but I burned it as soon as I got home. <laughs> I had some other interactions with Senator McCarthy. Those are all of my memoirs as well, yes. The, I think your memoir is going to take people through history through times that so many different gen so many decades of the things that have happened, the sixties, just just whatever you must have written about, the things that went on in the sixties and seventies, these are all uh parts of history. They're not just your personal memoir life. You were part of those parts of history being a participant at that time. And so the fact that you've taken the time to write this and share with everybody what you experienced from your personal life is to me, as you said, it's an inspiration on memoir writing and the reason that people should do this. Oh, good heavens, yes. That was one way that I decided to write the memoirs, putting them in a historical context. Because for better or for worse, I've lived through some very important historical times. Mm -hmm. And so my perspective on those times, I think might be of value for future historians. I, I think that's, it's- uh... I've actually probably been present at three important historical events. First of all was the 100th birthday party of Albert Hoffman, where I gave the three talks. Mm -hmm. But also I was present at the inauguration of Ronald Reagan as president. I didn't vote for him, but I got an invitation to attend his inauguration. I was not gonna pass that up. Right. I was a member of the crowd, you know, mm -hmm. and saw everything going on. I uh, saw the parade and, uh, and everything. So that was a historic event. And then also I was present even before that, John F. Kennedy's famous birthday party, I think the 45th birthday party at Madison Square Garden, which was a fundraiser for his upcoming campaign. And this was the birthday party where Marilyn Monroe sang happy birthday to him. And yes, I was there. I, the way that I got a text of this detail in my memoirs, but that was quite an incredible event. And so, yeah, those are three actual historic events that that I was present for. Yes, and uh, I've seen clips of that, and it looked like the most sensual happy birthday song I'd ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, from such a magnificently sexually beautiful woman. Oh yes, and and his comment was so ironic. He said. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Miss Monroe, for such a wholesome tradition of happy birthday. It wasn't wholesome at all. No! It was very seductive. <laughs> and within a, within a few months, both of them were dead. Yes. Well, uh, I'm not sure how you're feeling if you want to talk anymore, because I know it can be tiring to be on these interviews. Uh, I um I have a couple more questions, but no, go ahead. As long as you have the questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Sure. Okay, so this is a an interesting question. Two questions. I think an important question is why. So what what would you tell a viewer right now about why they should want to read this book? A good question, and I don't have an easy answer for it. Of course. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't see why anybody would want to read my about my life uh, at first glance. I, I suppose that's why I could answer that. First of all, the people who know me either well or not well, but who know me, might be interested in getting more of a background about me and my life. But also, I think people who don't know me would want to read the book because it gives a historical perspective and hopefully in a very entertaining, informative way. Yes, and we're talking 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, into the 21st century. 
this is a lot of historical information and you were there on the scene. Um, oh yes, and right now I'm involved with Psychologists Against Anti-Semitism. That's one of my projects. Mm -hmm. My work on post-traumatic stress disorder is being used in Ukraine by the therapists who are working with uh, traumatized uh, adults and children. Uh, so, so it brings you into the 21st century as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, so you've written so many books, but I'm wondering, uh, what do you like to do when you're not writing a book? Oh, this will have to be my last book because my mind is just not adept enough to write another book. But I do, of course, I do lots of things uh, besides writing books. It's uh, one of many, many things I do. I, as you know from the book and our personal conversations, I enjoy music a lot, all types of music. And of course, rock music, but I'm also a great opera buff. And some of my most exquisite experiences has been not only at the Metropolitan Opera, but the San Francisco Opera and half a dozen operas in, in Europe. And I also like to go to the theater. I like to go to movies. Those are all things that entertain me where I don't have to entertain other people. Yes. And of course, as you know, I enjoy being with friends. I have a wide circle of friends and uh, I'm lucky enough that we that I'm still adept enough uh, and lucid enough to enjoy our times together. Mm -hmm. I, I think you have a very, very rich life surrounded by an incredible amount of people who love and adore you, including my own self. And uh, I'm so glad that I'm only 45 minutes from where you live. So, you know, anytime you need me, I'm happy to happy to zip down there to help you with anything ever. I. Um, well, I think I'm going to wind up with this last question here, which is, do you have advice for, I know you don't like to really give advice, but do you have, I find you to be an incredibly inspirational person. And whenever I think to myself, oh, maybe I'm, you know, oh, I've got an ache and a pain, or I've got this thing in my body, or oh God, maybe I shouldn't go. I think of you going to see um, uh, uh, Lady Gaga, and going off to do these things. And I'm thinking to myself, Stanley doesn't let anything stop him. He doesn't, doesn't matter to him what his body's doing. He goes and he lives life to the fullest. <laughs> and you're, it's inspirational that way. And I have never heard you say, and I've known you about, I think, 20 years now. I've never heard you say a bad word about anyone. You have uh, the kindest and most loving heart. And it, it's just through and through that's who you are and that's i'm sure going to shine in the book when they read it so is there anything you'd want to offer people who are writing or is there anything you would have told your younger self that you know like your mother knew that you should make these uh scrapbooks you know now to, that you've always kept information so that you can go back to it when you write is there anything you'd want to tell any other future writers well one thing that I remember about Alan Watts, he never gave advice. He described the world as he saw it, gave his perspective on different things. If people resonated with them, they would go away with something. Mm -hmm. But he never said, this is what you must do, that is what you must do. To be very frank with you, some of my best friends have given me advice which were disastrous <laughs> that I never should have done. <laughs> Yes. And I don't want to be in that position. Yes, in the book, I tell things the way I see them. And if they're a value of people, that's fine. I'm delighted. Mm -hmm. And so you encourage other people to take up a pen and start writing or to sit down at the computer and think, think about things about their own life that they can share? Good heavens. And if they want to give advice, that's fine. I think that Advice can be a two-edged sword. Mm -hmm. When you give advice, think of what the repercussions might be if people follow that advice. Yes. 
it's a responsibility when you give advice to someone. You know, you're taking a responsibility by giving them advice about something that they may or may not do. And so that's kind of a tight. I, I, anyways, I thought when you, I heard you say that the other day, I don't give advice. I thought, wow, that's a really interesting. And now I know. So that was Alan Watts who uh, e expressed that, and you decided that that was a good thing to do. And I think that's wonderful. So I'm winding down now. And what I'd like to say is how much I enjoy being here with you, and that if there's anything else about your incredible memoir um a, a chaotic life uh if there's anything else you'd like to share with the listeners about anything else about your book or your life or how anything you'd like to wind up with here i suppose i should explain the title my whole life has been chaotic in two ways first of all yes there's been a lot of chaos in my life uh, a lot of unpredictable things a lot of ups and a lot of downs but also i am a student of chaos theory and on chaos theory, one of the main functions is how a very, very small event, if you trace it, can have incredibly important consequences. It's not a cause and effect. It's not linear. It's chaotic. It's nonlinear. And to get into a nonlinear state of mind is really, I think, mind expanding for me and maybe for readers as well. Well, thank you. I want to thank you for sharing your words of wisdom here today, sharing parts of your incredible, amazing life filled with the most interesting characters, you being the main one. And I want to say that I'm honored to be your to be your friend and to have you on my podcast and for all the amazing things. I don't want to start crying, but you've done so many wonderful things for me in my life. And You've introduced me to interesting people and you've sent me wonderful characters that I've had on my podcast. And all you have to do is say, I recommend that you go on this and the people immediately will be on my show. All they have to do is <laughs> Stanley said he recommends you just try her out and they're happy to be on my show. And we end up all at every show. We talk about how happy we are that you came into our lives. So I want to thank you very, very much, Stanley, for being there, for being in our lives, and for being who you are today. Well, your viewers and listeners are lucky to have you as a podcaster, because you, your perspectives, is really nobody else could give. And so it's a very, very special podcast that you've arranged. Uh, well, thank you so much for your support and encouragement. And um, I hope my tears aren't coming out too far to fog up my eyes over here. Uh, I'm going to do a little closing. If you'll just wait for one second, don't go away. So listeners, I want to thank you so much for being here today for this amazing, wonderful interview with Dr. Stanley Krippner on his new book, A Chaotic Life. I hope you get your copy today. And I also want to thank my son, Richard, and my daughter, Nancy, for producing my show and for posting it and doing all the wonderful work they do, helping me get the podcast out. And I want to thank the listeners for subscribing, liking, sharing, and for uh, joining us for these different, different interviews. So have a wonderful day. Remember to share all your stories, because remember, stories can heal. So thank you, listeners. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. 